some examples of prayer on a few of these Sunday evenings. And this evening, if you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18, let's notice the prayer of Abraham interceding for Lot. Genesis chapter 18. First of all, I noticed that in this particular situation, there was a great need. Now, Lot had lived with his uncle Abraham. He was an orphan. Abraham took him in, cared for him, trained him, uh, helped him get started in his uh, cattle business, and he prospered. And time came when their flocks were so great they had to separate. Not enough grass in one place for all of their flocks, so they had to divide. And so Abraham said to Lot, you choose. And Lot looked around and picked out the best land there was, down there toward the Jordan River. Lush like a plain, well watered there. His cattle would be fat. He would become rich, and he could have a good time too. And he chose the best for himself, which was not very kind of him. Abraham had brought him up. Abraham had taken care of him. Abraham was a senior, and Abraham had basically given Lot everything he had. And so when he, it's to make a choice. He chooses the best for himself and Abraham gets the leftovers. He made the choice, and then it says, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. Lot's an illustration of the carnal Christian who has a desire for the world, and Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom, and every time he had to break camp and move a little further, he moved a little closer to Sodom until eventually he was there living in that city. And uh, that's always the way it is, you know. The carnal heart pulls people closer and closer and closer to the world until they are swallowed up by the world. So finally, Lot ended up in Sodom, which was a wicked place. Sodom was a cesspool of immoral perversion. And the principal sin of that city was homosexuality. The people were addicted to those kind of sins. Look at Genesis chapter, back a couple pages to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, it says, The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They were wicked and exceeding sinners. Chapter 18, verse 20. Chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous. And in chapter 19, verse 30, it says, we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And there was Lot living in that city surrounded by lost people. And so in chapter 18, we see the angels of God walking down the trail towards Sodom to bring destruction upon that city. That city is to be destroyed. In chapter 18, verse 16, it says, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham with, went with them to bring them on the way. They've been with Abraham, had a meal with him, and now they start out down the road towards Sodom. And as was proper etiquette in those days, the host would go along with them part way to get them started. Verse 22, and it says, The men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. And there they are, going to that wicked city. And that wicked city filled with lost souls. And Lot and his family are doomed because judgment is coming upon that city. And you know, that's the condition of most of the world around us. People are lost. Billions of people in this world lost without Christ. And judgment is coming. I don't know when, but every day we're closer Apostle Peter says, the day of the Lord will come. The earth shall be burned up and the heavens shall pass away with fervent heat and all that is therein shall be destroyed. That day's coming. Judgment's coming. And here was a city 
and a people and lot in great need. Now, the second fact I want us to notice is this. Abraham was concerned. Concerned. God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot and his family were there. Now, it hadn't been too much before this that Abraham had rescued Lot. Remember that little band of people came through there and carried off Lot and most of the people in Sodom, and Abraham took his men and chased them down and caught them and defeated the enemy and rescued Lot and brought him back home again. And now here is Lot, and he's in a mess again. Of course, when you live in the world, with the world, follow the world, you're always going to be a mess, one kind or another. And so Lot was in trouble again. And Abraham was concerned for him. That's good. It's good to be concerned for others. How concerned are we for the lost? Lamentations, the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah said to the people that are watching the destruction uh, of Jerusalem says, Is it nothing to you, O ye that pass by? Do ye even care that the city of Jerusalem is going up in smoke and the people are being destroyed and killed and captured? Look at Romans chapter 10 with me. Paul's concern. Romans chapter 10. Verse 1. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. In verse nine, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren and my kinsmen according to the flesh. I wish I could be lost and take their place in hell if they could be saved. What a concern. Paul was concerned for his people. And Abraham was concerned for Lot. Now, what could Abraham do? Those angels are going down there to destroy the city. What can Abraham do about it? Uh, could he rush down and build a bomb, bomb shelter over the city of Sodom? No, couldn't do that. Uh, could he go down there and get hold of Lot and his family and drag them out forcibly? No, Abraham couldn't do that. There's the only one thing he could do, and that's pray. And that's the same with a lot of the lost people you know, you know. What can you do? You can't drag them to church. You can't force them to listen to you, witness to them. And maybe they're not interested at all. And you say, what can I do? Well, there's one thing they can't stop you from doing. I mean, they can shut their ears, they can run away, they can avoid you, but they can't stop you from praying. That we can do. Any lost person you know, you can pray for them. And we not ought to be concerned for lost people. Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost. And we're concerned about everything else. How concerned are we for lost people? I suppose some men are more concerned that the Bears are in a football game than they are concerned about lost people. Do we have concern? Abraham was concerned. And then I notice that Abraham was on what we call praying ground. He was on praying ground. He prayed for a lot. And there was only thing, one thing that stood between Lot and destruction, and that was the prayers of Abraham. And that may be the way it is with some people you know, some lost people. They're on their way to hell. The destruction of God is coming their way. And maybe the only thing that stands between them and a lost eternity is your prayers. Now, consider this praying situation of Abraham. The first, I think he was made bold by God's promise. You go back in chapter 18 and verse 14, and you remember how the angels had come to Abraham's tent, and as they were there, the Lord made him this promise. Verse 14, he said, It's anything too hard for the Lord. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, that had been promised to Abraham before, but it never happened. And he waited 30, 40, 50 years. And he's still waiting. He's almost 100 years old. Sarah's too old to have children. Abraham's too old to have children. But God says, Abraham, you're going to have a son. A great promise. Now, you know, I think that promise that God made Abraham just gave him a little spiritual boost. In other words, if God could do that, why can't he do something else I ask him for? And in your life, you know, every answer to prayer you get, 
every promise that God makes to you ought to encourage you and me to ask for more. God does one thing, ask him for more. Ask for more. Now Abraham, I think, was bold enough to ask for more because God had just done something wonderful. Made him a great promise. Uh, secondly, I think Abraham was on praying ground because he just shown great respect to God. Here are these men, these three men, come walking down the road, and Abraham saw them. He ran out to meet them. He invited them to come in and stop and have refreshments with him. And it says, notice it says in chapter 18, verse 2, uh, uh, in the middle of verse 2, he ran to meet them from the tent and bowed himself toward the ground. Uh, he sat them down. In verse 6, Abraham hastened into the tent on Sarah, said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran out onto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto the young men. And he hasted to dress it. He took butter and milk and the calf which he dressed and set it before them. He stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Now, he fixed and played a feast. Uh, three measures of uh, three measures of meal, it said, fine meal. Now, that's like a couple bushel baskets full. This isn't for a church dinner. This isn't for a couple hundred people. This is for three men and Abraham. Small number. And yet, he makes this huge amount of food, and he kills a whole calf. I mean, three men can't eat a calf, but he killed a fatted calf and got it. And I'm interested to that phrase that says, he stood, uh, he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. I never understood that phrase. What did he stand there and watch them eat for? Until I went to India the first time. And I went over to India, first time I'd been there, and this was, things have changed now, they got a little more modernized in India, but this was in 1995, and things were still uh, the old way there. And I went to stay at Dr. Joshua's house, and they entertained me fine, but it kind of irritated me a little bit. Uh, they would serve me a meal, and uh, Jeff Yeager was with me, we'd sit down to eat, and Joshua would stand there behind us and watch us eat and see that somebody would bring us food all the time. And I said, well, you know, why don't you just sit down? And said, we don't do it in this country. But you know, uh, 4,000 years ago, that was, still, that was the custom then. And it's still that custom in that part of the country, in the, in the country. And uh, the host stands by the guests and watches them eat instead of eating with them. And so that's just a matter of respect in their customs. And so, uh, Abraham was standing there, and he'd get, gotten his food to them, and he showed them respect by eating for them. And I hope that we show God the proper respect that we ought, like Abraham did. And then I notice going on here that God wanted him to pray. Chapter 18, verse 16. As they get ready to go on their way, and they start down the road, and they're talking... And it says, verse 16, the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, talking to the other angels, shall, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I shall do? Shall I hide from this thing that we're going to do and destroy Sodom? And verse, uh, and I believe that God was prompting him to pray. He was encouraging them to get concerned and to do something about this. And, and, you know, the Lord wants us to pray. The Lord tries to prompt us to pray. We're not always very, uh, very uh, eager or willing or ready to do that. But the Lord will prompt us to pray if we give him a chance. And I notice all this is part of the fact that Abraham was on praying ground. The fourth thing I notice is that he'd forgiven Lot. Now, Lot had been very unkind to Abraham when he took the best land and left Abraham with the worst land. But you know, uh, Lot rescued him. He still loved him. Uh, and uh, he'd forgiven Lot. It was obvious. He didn't bear any grudge, any hard feelings. Uh, he prays for it. No grudge, no ill feeling, forgiveness. Jesus said in the New Testament, remember, if you bring your sacrifice to the altar and remember that some man has ought against you, 
got a problem with somebody else, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your sacrifice. Get right with your brother first. And if you would go around carrying a grudge or ill feelings, not likely you'll make much progress in your prayers. Abraham had forgiven Lot. And uh, a fifth thing I notice here is that he was, shall we say, respected by God. Chapter 18, verse 19. God says to the other angels, I know him, that is Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And uh, he says, I know Abraham. Uh, I know what he's going to do, the way he's going to live. Now, how many people do you know of in the scripture that God, shall we say, bragged on? Not very many. Job? Devil, have you seen Job? There's a righteous man. You seen him? And here he's in Abraham. He's a good man. Uh, what would God say about you or me if he had to make comment on us? I hope he could say good things. Uh, God respected Abraham, appreciated Abraham's godliness. And then verse, uh, the sixth thing I notice is that Abraham walked on with God, figuratively as well as spiritually. Chapter 18, verse 16, the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. We read about Enoch, he walked with God, and here Abraham walked with God, but how many Christians do you know of that think they can walk with the world and still get answers from God? It doesn't work that way. If you want answers from God, you better walk with God. Now, the seventh thing I notice is that eventually he was alone with God. Chapter 18, verse 22. The men, those other two angels, turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. <clears throat> Back home was the crowd of people around Abraham's place, and now that's way off in the distance. And the two angels have been with them. <clears throat> now they've gone on, down on their way to Sodom, and it's all quiet. Nobody there but Abraham and God. You know when it's quiet and alone, that's when you can do business with God. We live in a world with so much noise, so many people, so much commotion going on all the time. It's a rare thing to be alone. But there's an advantage in that. Remember, Moses was alone at the burning bush where God commissioned him. And Elijah was on, alone on the mountain when he heard that still small voice. And Jesus was alone in the garden in that last prayer with God, his Father. And Jesus said, you don't pray on the corner, street corner where everybody can see you. You enter into your closet and shut the door and then you can pray. And you need time in your life, a time and a place to be alone with God on occasion. And then it says, Next, I notice that he drew near, near to God. Chapter 18, verse 23. And it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Uh, what would the Lord say? He drew near. And we know that verse of Scripture. God says, Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. Abraham drew near to God. I don't know how far he'd been from God, but he got real close. Uh, why do you have to do that? Is God hard of hearing? You've got to get close so he can hear you? No, it's a spiritual example to us. You know, If you want to pray effectively, get alone with God, remove the barriers, get away from the world, and get close to God. And Abraham and God got near, and then Abraham began to plead. So the fourth thing we notice in this chapter is that Abraham made intercession. Now much of our praying is praying for ourselves. Lord, I need this and this and this and help me in this and this and this problem and so on. Praying for ourselves. 
Well, that's all right. But there's another kind of praying, and that's intercession. Intercession is praying for other people. And Abraham was concerned for Lot. He was burdened for Lot. He was praying for Lot. And those prayers, what was going to hold back the judgment of God? And that's the way it in your life as well, that unsafe person that you know, that you're concerned about. The only thing, maybe the only thing that prevents him from the eternal judgment of God is your prayers. Scripture says, God has set the ungodly in slippery places. Another place says, his foot shall slide in due time. The unsafe person is teetering on the edge, on the brink of a lost eternity. And so Abraham was concerned and he began to pray. Notice chapter 18, verse 24. Peradventure, Abraham says, what if there be 50 righteous within that city? Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He's given God a reason why God should heed his prayer. He says, Lord, it wouldn't be right for you. You're a righteous judge. You're the judge of all the earth, and the judge has to do right. And if you're going to destroy the righteous people along with the unrighteous, then that wouldn't be right. And he persisted. Verse 26. The Lord said, all right, Abraham, I'll give in to that. If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham prayed more. Verse 28. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he, that is God, said to Abraham, Okay, if I find forty and five, I will not destroy it. Verse 29. And he spake unto him yet again. He keeps on and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. Now, Abraham says, well, this is going all right. Fifty, forty-five, forty. Uh, God's listening to me. God's giving in to me. God is agreeing. I'll take a bigger bite. He's been going down by five. I said, hey, let's go for ten. And so it goes from forty to thirty. Notice verse, uh, verse, uh, uh, verse thirty. And he said unto them, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak peradventure. There shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. You know, every answer we get from God, I do encourage us to ask for more. And that's what Abraham was doing. The more God yielded to him, the more he went on. But notice while he's doing this, notice his humility. Go back to verse 27. Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Lord, I, I'm nothing. And here I am pleading with Almighty God, and I'm just dust and ashes. Verse 30. He said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. And verse 32. He said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. You see, in humility, he is pleading with him. Remember when David prayed and he says, Oh, Lord, I'm just a poor shepherd boy. And you talked about my kingdom uh, continuing uh, unto eternity. Will you do that for me when I'm just such a weak, simple man? And isn't it amazing that we sinners can come boldly to the throne of grace. We who are nothing can come before the king of the universe. And he's glad for us to do so. Proverbs 15, 8, it says, The prayer of the upright is his delight. In James 1, 5, You lack wisdom, ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. He doesn't get after you when you ask. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. God delights when we come to him asking. But ask in humility. 
And I see then that Abraham prayed persistently. He didn't stop at 30. He didn't know if 30 would make it. He didn't really know if there were 30 righteous people in that city. So he says, I better push this a little bit further. Verse 31. He said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Verse 32. And he said, Let not the Lord be angry. I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Abraham, if there's ten righteous people there. I'll hear you. I'll answer your prayer. I'll just deliver it for ten people's sake. This thing is kind of like pole vaulting. You know how they do pole vaulting? They put the bar up there, and everybody jumps over it, so they push it up six inches. They jump over that, they push it up some more, and they keep pushing it up until they can't jump over it anymore. And that's what Abraham was doing. kept raising the bar, raising the bar further and further. And he gets to ten, and then he says, God says, Abraham, I won't destroy the city for ten's sake. And Abraham stopped asking. Hmm. Why did he stop? I can't be sure. Did he think he was wearing out God's patience? I better not push it any further. He might get angry with me. I don't know that that was it. I'm suspicious that Abraham thought he'd gone far enough. Surely there would be ten in that city. After all, there was Lot and his wife, that's two. He had two daughters at home, that's four. And then it refers to Lot's son-in-laws. Now, it doesn't say how many, but it was at least two. And I think it was probably three. Three son-in-laws and their wife, that's six. Lot and his wife, that's eight. Two daughters, that's ten. I think Abraham thought, okay, we've got it now. There's bound to be ten there, surely Lot's family, all of his family are righteous people. But you know, Abraham didn't go far enough. Didn't go far enough. Remember many years later, a king named Josiah went to visit Elisha when Elisha was sick, dying. And the big problem then was the Syrians. They were giving him a hard time. And Abraham says, take your bow and arrow and shoot out the window. And he shot an arrow out the window. And he says, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Now, King Josiah, take your arrows and smite on the ground. And he hit three times on the ground and stopped. And Elisha was angry. He said, you should have hit five or six times. And now you'll only defeat the the Syrians three times. If you'd struck five or six times, then you would have defeated them completely. You stopped too soon. That's the same thing that Abraham did. Stop too soon. One of the old commentators makes an interesting statement. He said, God did not leave off granting until Abraham left off asking. God hadn't said to Abraham, Abraham, ten, that's the limit. No more now, that's it. No, he hadn't said that. And, you know, we're always in more danger of asking too little than we are of asking too much. Is there anywhere in the Bible where it says somebody asked too much from God? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is any order too big for the Lord to fill? Adoniram Judson prayed that the whole nation of Burma would turn to God. Didn't happen in his day, but God's still working on it. And you and I are having a little part in bringing that about. Listen, don't be too timid to ask God for great things. We need people in our churches, in this church, praying that God would do great things. We need God to do great things for us in these days. And after the service, I've got, if you really like to pray for some of these new people that are coming, I've got some little prayer sheets I can give you. If you really want to and we'll pray for them, I'll give you one. Now see me about that afterwards. We need praying people. Now let's go on to verse 33. Verse 33 says, And the Lord went his way 
as soon as he left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Abraham was done praying. So the Lord left and went on his way. But notice, God didn't leave till Abraham was done. Isaiah says, Is the Lord's arm shortened that it cannot save? Is his ear heavy that he will not hear? No, God is always ready to hear. And we need to pray like that widow going to that unjust judge. And we might need to pray like that man uh, who uh, wanted to borrow bread from his neighbor late at night. And we need to pray like Jacob who said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So God went on his way and the judgment came. Chapter 18, verse 24. Oh, chapter 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. God sent destruction upon those cities. But notice verse 29, chapter 19, verse 29. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Judgment came, but God remembered Abraham. He didn't spare the city. There weren't ten righteous in that city, but he spared Lot and Lot's daughters. And so Abraham really obtained his objective. Lot was spared. But how many people do you know who are standing in danger of the judgment of God and they could be spared if we prayed like Abraham? Oh, how we need to learn to pray. How we need to learn to plead for souls. How we need to come before God and keep interceding until we get answers. Oh, that's what we need to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a man like Abraham who could teach us to pray because he prayed and prevailed with God. And you heard his prayers. And Lord, we pray that we might be moved to pray for lost souls. Pray that your spirit would convict them and your spirit would open their minds to understand the scripture and their uh, spiritual condition and turn to thee. Lord, help us to be praying people for lost souls and see souls saved and sinners convicted and lives transformed by the grace of God in answer to prayer. Bless we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.